Hey everybody, and welcome to the first beer and brands of 2023. All right, right 23. Yeah, 23 I, I, I lose track. I must be getting old. I'm Matt Williams, managing partner at Brand Federation, here with our founder and CEO Kelly O'Keefe. As Hi, always, today we are coming to you from Isley Brewing, which is a return engagement for us. And you know, if we're going to come back, we'll come back for Isley. The and beer is good. What the beer is amazing. We can't get Kelly to stop drinking the, the choosy mother. So we, here we are. We're going to talk with uh, Josh Stamps. From Isley, Josh, what are we drinking today? All right, gentlemen. Today, Ooh. I've got an old favorite and one of our new releases. All right. The old favorite is the Bribe. It's our oatmeal porter. It's also the base for our choosy mother. And this is Cosmic Cowboy, which is our newest hazy IPA. Wow. So that's All what right. we're working Sounds on. It's amazing. Amazing. Yes. Well... Cheers. Enjoy, Cheers. Gentlemen. We will be back to talk with Josh about Isley Brewing a little more in a second, but for now, let's, oh, let's, let's try it. Oh, well, thank you. All right, Kelly, so now we know why there was a third set of beers on the table, and it's because we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Brian, Brian Brown, Brown. All right, man. Virginia Commonwealth University School of here. Business and Brand Federation Consultant. That's right. Great to have it's you here, good. Brian. It's an honor. Yeah. It's, an honor. it's awesome to have you here, Brian. You and I have been working together for over a decade. Yeah. First met you when you came up to interview at VCU. I was impressed by you then, and, and the work that you've done at VCU has been amazing. I think it was later that I coaxed you over to do a little teaching for us at the Brand Center. Well, I was leaning that way anyway. So, oh, yeah. that's good. It <laughs> I wanted, was good. I wanted you didn't have to, to twist his arm yeah. too hard. No, the students were the beneficiary of that. <laughs> And then we've been able to work on lots of stuff in arts, in culture, in business, through Brand Federation and otherwise. So it's great to have you here talking to us today. It's my pleasure. So here's our plan, Brian. You are focused in your academic field on not just marketing, but business to business marketing. That's right. And there's lots of talk. We've all had clients in both B2B and B2C about what the difference is between the two disciplines of marketing. And it's been a little bit of a debate in some of the circles that we run in about, oh, no, people make too much of a big deal about the difference between the two. We're all human beings at the end of the day. But I think that that probably oversimplifies it. And there are some real differences between B2B and B2C. And we want to focus our conversation on that. So let's start at the top. What do you see and what have you learned in your studies about the real difference between business to business and business to consumer marketing? Well, first of all, what I would say is the, the principles are the same yeah. in branding. In the pr principles of branding apply to both contexts. Brands can simplify a decision because they differentiate. Brands can communicate certain values that you might want to communicate. And of course, brands can relieve risk mm -hmm. perceptions. But the simplest way to define the difference would be the intended use of the product and the intended customer. Yeah. So that, that's kind of the, the, the nutshell. But if you go deeper, the nuances really become more relevant and you can start to see how branding might have different implications. For example, it's a more complex product, generally speaking, in mm -hmm. the B2B setting. It's not a Kit Kat bar. It's a certain complexity to a Kit Kat bar. But I, I... <laughs> For some. <laughs> but most of us get it right away. It's a more technical product. The purchase process is a longer purchase yeah. process. And, and more people involved, right? It's a group decision yeah. that requires functions throughout an organization and maybe even beyond. To simplify it even further the new, with the nuances, what you might say in a consumer context would be an individual or a household making that decision. Mm -hmm. The more self-expressive kind of a purchase, right? Yeah. You know, a brand you know, that I like. I like that purchase. Yeah. On the other hand, in the business setting, as you mentioned, it's a group decision. And the decision to buy is usually more utilitarian, mm -hmm. right? It's usually a need. It's not an impulse buy. And as a result of that context, it requires usually a, you know, a personal relationships, right? To kind of build trust, understand the nuances of the client. In general, in the B2B setting, you have to customize whatever the offering might be. Mm -hmm. So you can start to think about some of the implications as a brand marketer. Wow, okay, a, a high risk purchase, a complex purchase, you know, multiple audiences that need to be- And that's just on the purchasing employed. side, and right? Exactly. So on the marketer side, there are also more people involved because you probably have a sales force 
that has to be able to carry the message of that brand forward. It's not just to you know make an ad and hope somebody picks it up in the checkout line. That's right. right. That's right. So <laughs> customer service can be involved. Right. Yeah. But customer service is great. What that usually implies is that the salesperson is going to play, understandably, a larger role. You know that that personal relationship really matters. That doesn't mean that branding doesn't matter. It just means that branding might play a different role than mm -hmm. in the consumer context. And what do you think are, are those comparative roles? We know the sales force is charged with often initiating relationships and then establishing those relationships, nursing things along so that they can get to the close. They have a lot of messaging to deliver interpersonally as part of that. They may have materials to deliver, but what role does brand play as it relates to that? Branding can simplify the process. You know, I like to, to call it air cover, right? You need the salesperson explaining the nuances and the details, but branding and the marketing communications effort can create awareness, can differentiate the brand in maybe a more creative way that might draw you know, the attention of the buyer and the purchaser. So still a sales-oriented process perhaps, but the branding can really, can, it might reduce, help reduce some of the risk that a buyer might perceive, or maybe heighten the risk, because because in some cases you might want the brand that is well established to uh, sort of reduce that perceived risk. The old IBM mantra. Yeah, right. Nobody ever got fired for but, buying IBM. So speaks to the role that brands yeah. can play. So it sounds like the context is more complicated, but the role of the brand can be the same. You just have to consider as you establish what the role of that brand should be, or what the message of that brand should be how it resonates with a much more complicated purchase environment. Which is exactly right. And too often, what you'll find in the B2B context, and I, and I know that we've discussed this before, B2B marketers don't realize the importance of the brand, right? They default to the product, the functionality, mm -hmm. the utility, mm -hmm. and they don't realize that the client, even though it's a business, is still comprised of humans. We still want to be entertained and engaged. We've all been in that meeting where you're in a business to business meeting with a marketing department or with the CFO or the CEO and he or she looks at you and says brand. We don't need brand. Like like they think of brand as a dirty word, right? Yeah. They associate it with, oh yeah, that's all that wasteful spending on big ad campaigns. We don't need that. It's as though they on the weekends they're consumers, but you know, during the day and during the week yeah, all right. of a sudden they're rational buyers that don't get influenced yeah. by these nuances and subjective criteria, but they're humans, right? They are humans and telling a story that's emotional, that's meaningful, that connects, that is engaging. Mm -hmm. That could be the competitive wow. difference. That's interesting. And can't a brand in B2B also build a reputation? Sometimes when, when those businesses say, well, I don't think branding is really for us, we, we're more focused on product benefits and marketing, Always think of, well, you've got to have a reputation, right? If you have a bad reputation, we're not going to want to do work with you. If you have a good reputation, we are more inclined to do that work. It doesn't eliminate the value of the other parts of the selling messages. But if you have a great reputation, if you built a brand that really makes this company attractive as a company, then selling the products underneath that umbrella it's just a lot easier. And you could argue that it might be more critical in the B2B setting where trust is just such a critical component. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so reputation is short for trust. And when you're making a long-term commitment like you are in a B2B buy, it's a multi-year It's commitment. not a Kit Kat bar. It's not a Kit Kat, going <laughs> back to that, right? And so trust and reputation is absolutely critical. And in a business-to-business -business setting, it's a corporate brand, right? Mm -hmm. It might be a corporate brand, but that brand stands for all of the products and all of the services that that entity mm -hmm. offers. It sounds like we can screw this up on both ends, right? On one mm -hmm. end, we can say, ah, there's really no difference between B2B and B2C marketing. It's all the same. We're all human beings. We just need to create a brand that grabs, you, grabs your attention and compels you to buy whatever the product is. That's an oversimplification and the, a denial of the differences, the real differences between a B2C purchase and a B2B purchase. On the other end, we can go the other way, which is to completely deny the value of branding in a B2B context and say, no, 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 that brand doesn't matter. It's all about the rational arguments and the sales force. And, and you say, no, 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 both those are wrong. You have to accept the differences, but you also have to know that a brand can operate in a really powerful way in a B2B setting as long as you're thoughtful about what you expect it to do. 
particularly because of the complications of the selling process and offer. As much as we would like to be rational, and everybody wants to be rational, there's a concept. I'm going to throw out an academic term that we use. Every, I'm not ready yes, yet. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Bounded rationality, which wow. means that the That's B2B awesome. organization wants to look at every spec, wants to think about every technicality, but they can't. And so the brand can help. The reputation of the brand can help simplify the offering, provide confidence in the performance and all of the utility that you might expect so that reputation can really be the difference. So I love that. So our rational thinking can only take us so far. Exactly. Yeah. Having a reputation that goes across products. If we've had that great relationship, for example, with a brand, or if we think the brand really is a leader in a category, then even if I can't understand everything that I might wish to understand about a product, and we humans aren't generally that rational. This will help us make that decision and feel confident about that decision. It could be the difference maker. Yeah. The branding could be the wild card in a very competitive landscape. Yeah, and Kelly, what you're doing is reframing the discussion of branding for a, maybe a skeptical B2B audience to say, Sorry. look, set aside the baggage you may associate with the word brand. Think of it as a reputation. Yeah. You need to invest in building the reputation of your company so that it aids in the sales process. That's what a brand really does for a company, especially a B2B company, is it elevates the reputation so that it does two things. One, it, we are more aware of your reputation and so that you are delivering the reputation that you wish to deliver. In other words, if you feel like you're a really innovative company but not getting credit for it, then that's a problem. That's, that's going to haunt you no matter how good your sales force is. Yep. But if you can make sure that you have both a reputation that's well known and a reputation that is known for the things that you hope to win on, then you're just going to give lift to your sales efforts. Yep. 100%. I'll tell you, we didn't talk about what led me to B2B branding. I started at Coke as a consumer marketer, thought that was going to be my academic pursuit, realized that libraries are filled with books and articles about consumer brands but one or two B2B brands on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And what I realized after watching the BASF commercials, do you remember uh, yeah, those? You, sure we do. don't make the carpet fiber, we make the That's carpet. That's right, we make I the saw things that, that make the carpet ad. fiber better. Yes, but, yeah. looking at those ads and how slick they were and sophisticated they were, maybe, wait a second, this brand, this B2B chemical company is using all of the sophistication of its consumer counterparts and telling a story which is to say we're innovative mm -hmm. and we're great partners and we're going to yeah. make your offering better. And that's where you, so that's the reputation that BASF established because it relied on branding, emotion, storytelling, as well as communicating an awesome product that was going to make your business perform better. It Amazing. seems to me they applied a technique that, that we see often in business to business branding as well, which is to say, yeah, maybe I just make this component. And it's hard for you to visualize how that component is valuable. But I'm going to talk about that component as being vital to the things that you do know and understand. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't know anything about this chemical treatment that goes onto carpet, but you know that you want your carpet to perform. Yeah. Yeah, and it won't without this. And it won't. Let's boil it down. We can screw up B2B branding in a couple of ways. You can deny its difference from B2C. That's not correct. It's different. The process is different. The players are different. Mm -hmm. But you can also deny the power of a brand in that context. But brands have real power in a B2B context because they create the reputation that makes the sales process better. So, Brian, from an academic standpoint, what are you excited to explore in B2B branding for the new year? As I mentioned, I got into B2B branding and researching B2B branding because there just wasn't much yeah. there. And it was clearly a topic that practitioners were interested in because you see CDW, you see IBM, you see these big There's brands. There's a ton of money being they're, spent. They're, they're spending yes, a lot on of it. investment. And so in the last 10 years or so, academics have certainly been understanding and studying branding much more. What I'm studying now is more around creativity and the role that ad creativity plays in B2B marketing. You're starting to see B2B marketers even use 
Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel Live and, and other really cool, interesting, creative, fun mediums to build their brands and engage with customers. So my team and I, my co-authors, we're doing research around creativity, ad creativity. And what we're finding is that ad creativity, which is novelty and relevance, can make a difference in the B2B setting. Mm -hmm. It's not just funny consumer commercials that, that can really move the needle. That's really interesting. Yeah, novelty and relevance. In B2B, relevance matters. Right? It still needs to communicate some brand benefit that's going to add value for a client. Right. But the novelty can really play a big role in not only capturing attention, but maybe convincing buyers and decision makers to process the ad more closely. You're starting to see in our research, we brand recall is improved. Interesting. Um, so the typical brand metrics that you might look at, intent, et cetera, can be influenced by the balance of novelty and relevance, which again is ad creativity, mm. even in a B2B setting. And that was always the argument, right? Based on bounded rationality, these yeah. people don't leave their emotional selves behind when they walk out the door to go to the office every morning. That's right. If you can capture their attention, like a normal human being with something that's interesting and compelling and creative and put in front of them in a way that grabs their attention, and then makes the right points for their B2B brain, you can have the best of both. It's not to say that salespeople don't matter. It's not yeah, to right. say that trade shows don't matter. Those personal relationships and engagements that build relationships and trust do. However, an added boost that you can get is by standing for something that's a little bit different, that's a little bit more creative than just a machine. Okay. Or a fascinating process. creative marketers take heart. novelty and relevance. Yeah. <laughs> you can use both. All right, guys, let's do the uh, time honored tradition at Beer and Brands of winners and losers. I love this. So <laughs> let's kick it off with the kind of inescapable brand loser of the holiday, which is Southwest Airlines. That came to mind. Yeah, hard to avoid <laughs> that one, isn't it? It got really ugly. You know what? What's interesting, before we talk about the meltdown, that has been a great brand. All the way yeah. back to Herb Kelleher. Herb Kelleher, yep. his book got, it became a, a prototype for how to build a brand in a very difficult competitive industry yep. and do it with personality, with creativity, with honesty, with care. I think it's important to take note of that because that's what they threw away this holiday season. It's amazing, I teach a customer experience course for MBAs and Southwest is one of the examples I've always used. This is a brand that behaves in a way that sets it completely apart from all those other airlines that we would love to hate. It, it'll still a, be an example. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> Maybe a different one. I got to revise that be, lecture. Maybe still I gotta, be teaching yeah, that one. I got to talk to the professor about whether I need to revise that lecture. It's certainly a model for a unique strategic business model. It's certainly an example of a unique business model. But here's what a lot of marketers I think forget about Southwest. You can have the best marketing strategy, the personality, mm. you know, knowing who your segment is and your target and your positioning. But if your operations aren't in order, you know, you're at risk. Yeah. So whenever I teach my students, I always tell them, even though you think about marketing and you think about commercials and you think about all that stuff, it's marketing, it's operations, and it's financials. If your marketing is great, but you don't have the logistics to get people from A to B, or if you're not profitable, then your brand is at risk. No doubt about it. The other thing that's interesting in the Southwest context is if I'm in the airline business, I know there are going to be weather events that I can't do anything about. Right. right? And they're going to affect everybody. Especially at the holidays. Right. <laughs> when, it's, when it's going to happen because it matters most. And there's a billion people flying. <laughs> exactly. That, that's right. Exactly. I can anticipate these kind of disasters. But my brand will succeed or fail, not necessarily based on whether I experience those disasters, because they're going to happen. But how do I respond to them? How do I recover from those disasters? And in an uncharacteristic way, they just haven't recovered well. They There's seemed no unprepared. The recovery, I think, is key. But I think another lesson is, are you still innovating? Are you investing yeah. in innovation? Their infrastructure is obviously flawed. And, and from what That's I right. understand, you have to invest in your innovation and your operations over the long term. I think other airline brands took advantage of infrastructure development, 
evidently Southwest didn't. Yeah. What's interesting about that is it makes me feel like <clears throat> they built a great brand and then they rested on their laurels. That, they stopped innovating, they stopped improving. We've seen that again and again and again. You tend to think when a brand gets to a certain stature, it's invulnerable. But the opposite has been proven correct in history again and again. General Motors was the largest car company, went bankrupt. Sears, the largest retailer. We know where Sears is. I mean, there might be one open somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Next to the Blockbuster. <laughs> Next yeah. to the Blockbuster. Right. Again and again and again, we've seen titans, huge corporations, fall apart because they haven't kept innovating and because they didn't anticipate and, to your point, Matt, respond when they let somebody down. Yeah, and I think they can still do that. So Southwest can still recover. The question is, what kind of lessons they take from this experience? Yeah. There's an infrastructural operational lesson, like you mm -hmm. mentioned, which is, you know, they don't rub a, run a hub and spoke system like most of the other major That's airlines right. do. This revealed a weakness in it. They should be thinking about that. They didn't recover and respond to this the way they maybe should have. They mm -hmm. should be looking at that. So they can still recover. Um, but it hasn't been pretty for our yeah, friends and, at Southwest. And every big brand, as you mentioned, you, you get bigger, you get more established, you get more complacent. Every big brand faces the challenge of how do we keep that, that insurgent attitude that got yeah. us to where we are. Yeah. It's, and Keller it's, was it's, nothing if not that. It's, it's yeah. hard to do that. It's hard to maintain a culture mm -hmm. of risk taking and, and aggressiveness and investing in your brand. So lots of lessons from, from Southwest. All right, well, yeah. let's pivot to a winner, which is actually a corollary to Southwest. And when we think about winners, one of the winners you can think about is the holiday supply chain, right? Because they were buffeted by exactly the same weather problems that crippled Southwest. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, but Amazon and UPS and FedEx, they were delivering things on time. Everything was under my tree the way it was supposed to be. It was amazing, actually. Sometimes you know you're successful when nobody hears about you. The it's umpire. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, we've had holiday seasons where UPS and FedEx got bashed. Yes. Yeah. We didn't hear about those brands. We didn't hear much about supply chain. There were still packages on the front porch. And I think that is a big winner. It's kind work. of extraordinary given the complete disruption of the supply chain mm -hmm. that we've had over the past year that they were able to do a better job at getting us our packages delivered to our door than the airline industry was getting people delivered. <laughs> like we had a whole bunch of gifts under the tree and nobody was there to open them. Yeah. <laughs> not sure I'd like that, but... It, but just, it depends on your priorities. It does. Yeah, right. I'm glad I got the packages. <laughs> credit, credit should go to Amazon, to UPS, to FedEx, FedEx to all cetera, of the players. Yeah who really worked very tirelessly to overcome challenges, to make sure that the goods flowed and that Christmases were, mm -hmm. were what we expected. We're and you're right, how much harder it must have been given the challenges they've had over the last year, compounded with busiest time of year at Christmas and they came through with flying colors. And Pretty they amazing. had the same weather that Southwest had. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> they landed at the same airports. <laughs> Somehow they got the packages there, but they couldn't get the people. There. That's or, right. Or the, or the luggage. Yeah. Or, the, or the luggage. Yeah. Cheers to, cheers to the supply chain. Excellent. One more brand. And I'm not sure whether to put this in the winner or the loser category because it depends on your perspective. A lot of controversy over the last couple of weeks with Equinox, the health club chain, who came out with a promotion right before New Year's saying that they don't honor January 1st, they think it's BS, they don't deal with January 1st, and on January 1st, they're not gonna accept any new members. And it's been really interesting to watch the response to that promotion. And a lot of fallout, <clears throat> a lot of people concerned about that. Yeah, both good and bad. Yeah. So what do you think, winner or loser? I think it's a winner. Ah. <clears throat> I think that one of the things that makes a great brand a great brand is not just what you add to it, but what you take away. Mm -hmm. Knowing the lane that you want to swim in, the territory that you want to own. Very good, yeah. And, and being dogmatic about that. Sticking to your knitting in terms of what you want to really offer to consumers. And I think that's a luxury brand. Mm -hmm. It's a brand of hardcore fitness buffs who care about being in there every single day. And I think it was on brand for them. 
Yeah, and I, I tend to agree. I think you know, it depends on how you define win and who's, who's defining win. Yeah. I'm a member of the Y, proud member of the YMCA. You are not their audience. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not the target. So while yeah. I might look at that ad and that campaign, and I might be offended, and I might think that's insulting, I'm not the target. And I think, you know, when yeah. you're in marketing, you, you, you know, all of us sometimes need to wear a T-shirt that says, I am not the target, and realize. <laughs> We're going to have that made. <laughs> yeah, and just realize that if the Equinox target, I don't know any members of Equinox. Perhaps you are a member of Equinox. I'm not a member of Equinox. <laughs> I don't but do I look like <laughs> <laughs> Have another beer, Kelly. It was, it was a rhetorical <laughs> question. But one of the things that I've learned from Coke and through other mentors is you have to know who your hard support is. You yeah. have to know who your core is. Yeah. In a political context, it's the folks that are going to show up and vote for you when it's rainy. I'm guessing Equinox's target market loves it. Yeah. And I'm thinking that the YMCA members are thinking, oh, I think that's... Those you know, guys are jerks. Yeah. 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 So, but who cares? So, like, so I've not, come yeah. around you're, you're to the not, same yeah. place you guys are, which is in the end, this is a win. Because it's getting us to talk about Equinox, but I'm not one who subscribes to the idea that any conversation about this brand is a win. I don't think that's true. I think I can talk about brands that I don't like in a way that accrues to the negative of that brand. So I don't buy the idea that just generating buzz is a win. Yeah. But I do think, to your guys' point, that there's a specific target audience that likes Equinox that would love the idea that this brand that I'm aligned with isn't taking these New Year's resolution members, because that's not what we're about. We're about hardcore exercise as part of my life kind of right. people. That's what we're about. I looked at that brand and I had the same reaction you did, which is like, I think these guys are jerks. But you know what? If that's my reaction to this, they don't want me. And they've made a strategic decision that they don't want me and they don't care if I think they're a jerk because I'm never going to buy their brand anyway. I, and the people they want are going to love it. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be too upset if the three of us show up right. and say, you know, what, do you have a free month trial? <laughs> I think you're going to be totally okay with that. I'm just going to have to go deal with these guns somewhere else, right? So, so, so yeah, like I didn't like it, and I had to get over my initial, like, dislike. My initial, you know, it repelled me because I thought this brand was talking like a like a butthole. I don't like these people, right? Yes, yeah. no, I but don't they don't either. need for me to like them. But here's what's interesting, another important point, which points to it maybe being an effective ad for the target that they're going after. Personally, I didn't hear about the, the commotion around Equinox from anywhere else other than the news. Yeah. So I think the folks that are getting Equinox ads are getting their communication in a more targeted fashion. The, the, most of us, I think, heard about this debate on the news, yeah. and, and that's not through marketing communications, yeah. right? So that's, that's telling me that they're probably being relatively targeted mm -hmm. with their messaging, which is usually a good thing. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. I don't think it's a winner because it's getting talked about, yeah. but they made a strategic choice and they executed very clearly against that strategic choice. And for them, it might have been the right one. Yeah, yeah. and we'll revisit it in, in December. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're back with Josh Stamps from Isley. Thanks, for, uh, thanks again for having us. Oh, absolutely. It's amazing. Great Clearly, we didn't like the beer very much. No, we're I, a I'm little pissed off at you that yeah. our glasses are empty. Hey, yeah. that'll happen. We got plenty more, so okay. we can fill them up for you. No worries. <laughs> it's good to hear. Well, that's right. So we've been here before. So mm -hmm. we've talked about the origins of Isley. We know where you all came from. But the, as we look at what you do, there's something really interesting and creative about the way you conduct your business. Mm -hmm. How do you decide which beers to brew? what directions to go in, how do you name them, how do you, what's your process? So we kind of draw inspiration from all over the map. We'll start with something early. So the Bride, for example, which was the darker beer that you guys had. When we first opened, I've actually been brewing that beer as a home brewer prior to, to coming to Isley Brewing Company and brought that recipe here. In Norse mythology, when death comes for you, death comes in the form of a cloven hoof, am, hoof animal, whether it be a goat or a cow or something like that. Watch and out for those. The theory <laughs> is that you can bribe death away with a barrel of oats. So we did an oatmeal porter. We figured the bribe. It was just kind of a cool, catchy, you know, kind of a, just thought it was kind of a cool story. How much easier than what my doctor has been telling me. <laughs> exactly. There you go, That's man. Right. Yeah, you could have saved so much money in doctor's fine. bills if you know, just bought a barrel of oats. Exactly. We've done a, uh, we did a pumpkin Belgian double over the years. It's called Stunt Double. And the name for that beer actually comes from uh, Mr. Ed, the famous horse. Of had course. a stunt double named Pumpkin. Thanks, Google just kind of randomly came across that one. We've done the Cosmic Cowboy that we had for you guys. The two hops that we utilize in that beer are Amarillo and Galaxy. So we kind of pulled our name just from that. So we kind of draw inspiration from a little bit of everywhere. 
As far as beer styles go, it's whatever myself and my assistant kind of feel like doing. You know, we tried a wide array of styles kind of available from the real whimsical to the very traditional and kind of yeah. a little bit of everything in between. And I know we discussed last time that we are a pretty small brewery, so we have a lot of flexibility as far as ingredients that we want to use, new styles that we want to try. Uh, we're going to roll out a Scottish ale here in the next couple of months, which is something that we actually in nine years have not brewed. Yeah. So we're excited to try that. And as far as our artwork goes, we have a, a guy here in town that does caricatures. His name is Brandon. And he's done kind of all of our caricature-y, kind of cartoony, you know, some of the fun labels. And then some of the other stuff has just kind of come from random different inspirations. We've got the Up All Night Coffee Porter. A friend of our owner had done a, a sketch for him of an owl with the big bugged out eyes, you yeah, know. Yeah. And so that's kind of where that came from. So we're a little all over the map with stuff and kind of just try to, again, not to put ourselves into too small of a box. That's cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the creativity and the openness that you guys have to just try new things. There's a freedom to it that's it's really, it's really cool. Very much in the spirit of the, uh, the kind of craft beer or artisanal beer renaissance. Is yeah. It really is. It's kind of get out there and try something that either you haven't seen or try to perfect something that you've seen out there in the market before or just shoot from the hip and see what we can come up with. I, I mean, think we can all learn something from yeah, that. Yeah, we enough. can. Fair enough. Well, you've built a great brand. We were just talking about the impact of creativity on branding, and I think you've demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. In, in the surroundings of your brand and also in this incredible beer. It is Thank good you. stuff. It is good. Awesome. Well, Josh, tell, tell our friends out there in podcast land one more time where they can find Isley Brewing Company. Where okay. are we? You can always find us here, 1715 Summit Avenue. Look around your local bottle shops and uh, beer distributors, grocery stores, anywhere that carries draft in the city of Richmond, all the way down through Tidewater region, Williamsburg. We even got a little bit, I think, has moved into North Carolina, just in a couple of bottle shops and stuff down there. But we're kind of slowly but surely growing that footprint. So get awesome. out there and find us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having Absolutely. us here at Absolutely. Isley Brewing Company. And thanks to you all for joining us for the uh, first Beer and Brands of 2023. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Happy everybody. New Year. We'll see you soon. I would say let's raise a glass to that, but my glass is out. <laughs> we'll get them filled God, up for you. No worries. Okay.